this is uh, an extended, slightly recut video that I posted some time ago. It uh, has to do with fire setting or using fire and water to work granite very efficiently, very quickly. Let's go. So first of all, what is fire setting? Prehistoric technique, again, even with Wikipedia, traditional mining method used from prehistoric times up to the Middle Ages. Uh, some places will still use it now because they don't have access to modern equipment. Basically, you set a fire next to a rock. The rock expands underneath the heat. This causes thermal shock micro cracks which form through the rock. And well, then basically the rock breaks apart with fire. Even just with fire alone and fire setting, you can break through granite, basalt very quickly by using fire setting, especially adding water to it. But you, you can then take a little bit step further and pound that rock down into a fine powder dust very quickly, which would be very good for drilling, polishing and grinding stone. But it's certainly an ancient technique. Evidence is clear and been practiced throughout. I'll put a number of links in the description but per Stormier has been one who's done uh, published and uh, done experiments on this so he was working at a chert or a flint quarry and uh, our ancient arrowheads axe heads blades and stuff so flint knives that type of stuff so how did they get this in ancient times flint was a massive trade item traveled you know huge distances to move but using stone and bone uh, and then fire, he was able, shows firstly how ex prehistoric damage on the stone at these quarries show that this technique was being used. But also, again, with very basic tools, you can work stone, work it rather quickly. You don't need advanced technology to do these things. And so also the flint, so cross Egypt and other parts of the world, of course, but the flint tools, they work to carve granite. I did some videos on this where... They used flint and stone pounders and we were able to make a granite sarcophagus and this type of stuff. So that's an important feature. Links in the description. Okay, so we had a massive rock here that we couldn't remove. Uh, we hired a jackhammer, a 27 kilogram jackhammer. Nothing seemed to work. We wasted two, three days on the jackhammer. We broke, I don't know how many drill bits of the jackhammer. Then we heard about a uh, fire setting to crack rock using heat and water so here we've just made a giant fire around the rock we opened up the space around the rock and uh, made a giant fire just with leftover wood of trees that we had killed on the site and uh, the fire has been going for about an hour just over an hour and just with the heat alone the rock seems to snap off naturally um, so a massive rock that we couldn't clear with a sledgehammer now gets cleared easily it's cracking so let me get in there and make some just hold the chair and film when I get in there just snaps right off get the hammer it's hot with the hammer. So that's how you break a massive rock using fire. Good luck. I conducted a series of fire setting experiments. Uh, when I originally posted this video, this is an update, uh, when I went a little, well, just made a small campfire in a very very short time so I was only 10 to 15 minutes very low flame and not even in direct flame just absorbing the heat now think about um, have you ever been to a stone building even in the middle of summer or been out hiking in the height of summer put your stone against the hand against your hand and you feel that it's cool uh, stone is a heat sink it sucks up the the heat that's why stone always feels cool because Put your hand it's not that necessarily that the stone is cold is that the stone is sucking the heat out of your hand so very small low temperature fire no you know thousand million degree temperatures 
uh, open air fire, so very not in a furnace, open air, low temperature fires. This is more than enough to break up a piece of granite. Not only granite, that particular block I use in there is of, of various granites I've got. Uh, that mother is super, super hard to work with, even compared to red, black, and grey granite. But fire it up only again for a very short time. You don't even need to go to an hour. If you burn for an hour, it'll basically start falling apart in front of you. Uh, but you only need to do it for five to ten minutes and then bring in a, a stone tool. And how quickly does it break up? Let me show you. After heating up the stone for uh, roughly f 15 minutes, uh, you could maybe do it in cycles a little bit longer, but again, it does not take a very long time. So uh, now I throw water on top, and so I'm going to go for a full fire setting, but again, very short time. Now if you look, you'll even see that... Uh, one of the blocks, where are we going to, just by moving it, now I'm going to move it a little bit more and see there's a massive, it's basically split in half, you'll see a crack there, you see the crack there, it's already broken up, uh, that stone is ready to break apart into tiny little pieces and then I'll bring in my uh, flint stone pounder and then this granite's going to break up in no time at all. So ancient quarrying technique. Again, these are very cheap, easy experiments. Very unfortunate that there's no experiment such as this done by the ancient lost high technology people. Apparently, we experimentalists, you know, we just sort of give up and throw our hands according to, to Bright Insight, who's never done anything anyway. But, yeah, so there you go. Smash it up. That You know, I could have spent hours and hours and hours with a stone pounder, uh, or I, you know, work smart not hard and then I break it up in no time at all so how do I release big granite blocks and this is not the only advantage notice the discoloration on it as well and the previous example uh, that I showed of the um, South African fellas there breaking it up they had that discoloration on there well there's another added advantage to this and I think that goes to actual ancient technology that sort of maybe has been overlooked and that's basically chemistry and well especially to deal with copper I'll do in short arsenical copper found in Egypt which is technically arsenical bronze because it has such high levels of arsenic that it could not have been added naturally uh, there's how did they extract the arsenic well most sources will say that the alchemists couldn't make arsenic or extract arsenic until about the third century BC by Zosimos in Egypt but okay, here's another piece. This is a piece of grey granite that I fire set as well. And so it's, it's not just about breaking up the stone and quarrying. There's also an added to it. So again, stone pounder with one hand. Uh, if I had done this without treating the granite, uh, I would have eventually broken it up into pieces. But what happens is, and again, I'm holding the camera in one hand and a bit uh, awkward there with the other side, but... We can start breaking up that granite. There's all little micro cracks in there. You take advantage of it and you'll see once it gets going, it just starts not only breaking apart, it's crumbling into a fine powder, a fine dust, fine little grit. So it's essentially, this, which is, uh, you know, silica and these hard minerals, which you can use and in other experiments, whether it was polishing granite, drilling granite or grinding granite down, I made my own abrasive. This is how I made the abrasive. I just burnt some granite, pounded it up with a, you know, not with a modern tool, but with a, a flint tool just to get that little bit of authenticity. And so once you have that dust, that's the abrasive that you can use. So I, I, corundum would be a better one, but like cuts like. If you want to cut, polish, drill, uh, or grind down granite, all you need is granite dust. Uh, to, to cut quickly, you want larger pieces. If you want to polish, to a really fine polish, you need to take that dust really, really fine. The finer the dust, the, the higher the polish. Just like really fine sandpaper versus really coarse sandpaper. You want to sand something down really quickly, you get the big rough grains. If you want to polish it, that sandpaper, you know, for polishing paint and other, it it's almost feels like paper. It doesn't feel rough at all because that's because the... Uh, the dust inside is so tiny uh, and the scratch which makes such invisible size scratches which a po highly polished surface just has really fine really tiny little scratches that you can't see to the naked eye 
So there's one way to, you know, make the abrasive, so the, which is another important, the leftover from the quarrying of the granite is not a waste material, it has value. So you can use it firstly maybe to make ramps and these other type and to backfill, but also to make the abrasive to do all the other necessary operations, cutting, drilling, polishing, etc. But there's an, once you've broken it into the dust, there's another, so what I did after this, I, I wanted to make that dust even finer. I wanted a really, really fine dust to do some polishing. And so what I did then was called calcining the sand, which the ancients referenced as well. Uh, so if you want to make a really good abrasive, especially from what um, Pliny calls Indian sand, uh, it needs to be cal burning. And so, where are we? Okay, next. All right, now later I... Now, I didn't have a copper pot. I would have used a copper pot. I had a steel one, but I put the, the dust, the sand in there, and I'm, I'm burning the sand. So just like breaking up a big block, you can take small little grains of rock, heat them up, cool them down, and they break apart into small pieces. Uh, now, what I noticed here was, well, the purple that's left over there, there you have some chemistry, there you have some alchemy, and that would be... Uh, very high in arsenic. Now, if you look up calcined sand, so for instance, tailing dams still now, they have high levels of arsenic there. That's the stone is releasing this, and it, well, it's a big problem in terms of pollution. But this is again, again, I'll follow up a little bit more. I've done some videos in the past on it on arsenical copper and bronze. The Egyptians didn't have pure copper, they had copper alloys, and the level of copper, uh, sorry, the level of arsenic in some of, it, for instance, old kingdom finds, such as Kasep Kemway, uh, they have up to 3% copper. That does not occur naturally. They've, the arsenic has been added, whether it was intentional, whether they knew about it, or whether, you know, uh, you can argue that, but the fact is that it's there, and the fact is that arsenical copper and bronze um, copper with more than 1% arsenic is defined as arsenical bronze, that has the equivalent strength of mild steel. The Egyptian chisels were not this soft copper that you've probably seen a lot of the, replica, uh, the reproductions. They had arsenical copper, actually arsenical bronze, and this is probably one way of it. So how did they add the copper, sorry, add the arsenic to the copper? Well, this could be one way, but it, uh, on so many levels, you can extract chemicals from this quarrying process so again the waste of the quarry is actually a resource that can be used and again the egyptians were engaged in chemistry to the level you want to argue but you know they had again their their makeup and their medicines they were using chemicals in that sense and so arsenical bronze how did they make it how did they get the arsenic i would probably say this is uh, a, a likely target of how they did it so there's each of these experiments on their own, they're important, but if, if a lost ancient high technologist took an interest and actually did these experiments, uh, if I were generally interested in these things, well, they would um, discover this and share it, of course, with their audience. But for for a decade, they're just recycling the same old narratives, narratives, and like, how did they cut granite? How did they do this? How did they do that? Well, uh, give it a go. At, you know, if get your hands dirty, you might learn something about that. Now, there's a lot to say on on that now let's go to now i'm going to show you a clip from uh a video top 10 discoveries of ancient egypt i'll put the whole documentary in there but we'll be looking looking at the unfinished obelisk at aswan and the use evidence of the use of fire setting in ancient egypt and so the granite quarries could have been worked very quickly let's play that clip working like a spiritual lightning conductor obelisks could collect and channel energy from the heavens. You had to have it in one solid piece of rock. If you had it broken, it would mean that the sunbeam was being broken, and thus you would shatter the power of the god. So when the engineers discovered a crack in the obelisk at Aswan, they abandoned it. A piece of bad luck for the ancient Egyptians, which is a piece of good luck for science. One of the things in archaeology that is almost as important as successes are the failures. Evidence on and around the obelisk is revealing how the ancient quarrymen excavated the massive stones. 
Like a thousand-ton time machine, it offers a snapshot of 3,000-year-old work in progress. Using the evidence from the unfinished obelisk in a brand new experiment, scientists hope to demonstrate how this was possible. We began to discover amazing things that did enrich our knowledge about obelisks for the first time. Adil Kalani has spent a career investigating ancient quarrying techniques. This is a good example for natural cracks in granite layers, which is really very important to looking for before to start working. Granite has naturally occurring fault lines where the rock is already weak. By identifying and targeting these fault lines, the ancient engineers could begin the process of splitting the stone from the bedrock. It would be the ease of chiseling rock because there, there would, you'd have to cut the face, you'd have to kind of break pieces out of it, but there'd always be this plane of weakness that would help separate the rock in an expeditious manner. In the second phase, laborers bashed handheld stone pounders into the fracture line to wear the rock down. These early sledgehammers were made of dolerite, a stone much harder than granite. But the technique took time. And time was a luxury that the quarrymen did not have. Pharaohs always wanted their monuments done in a hurry. Many pharaohs were worried that they simply wouldn't be around long enough. The average reign of a pharaoh was less than a decade. And no pharaoh would trust his legacy to his successor. You had all of eternity for your monuments to last, but you had a very short lifespan in which to get them built. From the sheer number of granite obelisks and statues across Egypt, it's clear that the ancient quarrymen found a solution. Beneath the quarry, the archaeologists found the clues which tell us what the solution was. What we have here, actually, it's all the story. It's like an open book. It tells us everything about what, what the Egyptian meant. Within the strata are charred mud bricks, burnt wood chips, and heat fractured shards of stone. From this, Adil believes he's worked out how Egypt's engineers accelerated the quarrying process. The Egyptian used fire to help them for splitting the stone. Heat from a fire would cause the rock to expand, and cooling would cause the rock to contract. This process weakens and can even split the rock. In theory, if the Egyptians could control this, they could split large sections of the granite. But Adil has not tested the theory till now. I'm excited to see the result because it's a new discovery. Exactly as the ancient engineers did, Adil selects a fault line in the rock. Mud bricks found at the unfinished obelisk site suggest that the ancient engineers built a wall to contain and control the fire. The fire raises the temperature of the rock to 800 degrees. This expands and stresses the rock. After 60 minutes of intense heat, it is safe for Adil to approach. Water causes the temperature to drop by 85% in seconds. The rock rapidly contracts. Ooh. No, it's very hot, very, very hot. But what damage has the heat done? Adil can now experiment whether the fire-weakened stone is easier to split than a second untreated fracture. After half an hour, he calls stop. Without fire, the workmen on the control test have made little impact on the fracture line. But at the burnt fracture, the crack is crumbling. You can see how the fire sitting affected with the granite layers. It's working very, very fast more than what we have expected before. That explains how the ancient Egyptian made a lot of obelisks in very, very short times. 
It's therefore likely that the way to quarry such large amounts of rock in such a short amount of time would be with the aid of fire. One of the main mystery of the ancient Egyptian techniques solved by this operation today. The unfinished obelisk offered the clues, then experimental archaeology showed that the theory could work. It explains how the Egyptians could quarry stone on a scale that was almost superhuman. We discovered exactly how they did cut an obelisk. These great monuments still have the power to inspire awe. They were built thousands of years ago. This is a clip from Per Stormy. Now he's at the church, all the flint quarry in right. Norway, but uh, again, I'll link this in the description, but it's important, one, because the previous clip where we saw them using the fire setting in Egypt at the Aswan quarry, they burnt it for an hour. Now even, and you saw the comparison of how quick, using fire setting, you absolutely chew through granite, you go through it so quickly. So the, you know, how long did it take to uh, carve out, for instance, the unfinished obelisks, or you saw another unfinished obelisk there in Egypt, uh, how quickly does this work? Well, they burnt for an hour, now the thing is here, uh, and what I found with my so first time I did fire setting I burn it for half an hour or an hour, an hour and uh, then I reduced the increments in 10 minutes on a campfire you can achieve fire setting uh, and, and destroy essentially you're destroying the granite because you're putting micro cracks through there you burn it for a little bit longer and the micro cracks become giant cracks so that's not even adding water to it just the application of fire for a short time has a huge effect on stone. So the unfinished obelisk as one, they were using fire setting it and not just uh, in the uh, workers village at Giza, they have fires, they have the examples of the fires there and they have granite chips that were found where they were firing the chip. So they might have been baking at the same time while you got the fire going, kill two birds with one stone throw some granite chips in there and you can make some abrasive and then grind it down. Then use that abrasive to uh, extract other chemicals from there as well. But yeah, short term fire setting, I'll put the link to a full clip in there. Small, low temperature flame, those flames are exposed to the air. It's not a furnace that's concentrating the heat. Low temperature, very short time and you can break up rocks like in, in minutes you'll start to do this. It's not like it takes centuries and thousands of years and you'd be blah, 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 blah. And then you bring your pounding stone in and uh, then you bring in a uh, tool, I mean a bone chisel gets in under it so you, you force the cracks and then with a piece of bone uh, there you have chert. Now this would work just as well with granite because the fire absolutely destroys the granite. One of the reasons that they, like particularly now, they don't like to build, well not now, let's say the 1800s when, when they were building, uh, for instance, stone buildings here. Firstly they were using, uh, sandstone and limestone is more resistant to fire. If you build a cathedral or a public building out of pure granite and there is a fire in there a small fire burning for a short time will absolutely destroy the building it might not crumble straight away but the, the structural integrity is just gone so there is a reason why not only the egyptians used uh mainly sandstone and limestone and with granite casings and we'll have a look in a moment in that as well. But granite's a great material for some features, but it is absolutely hopeless against fire. It's so much stronger than limestone and sandstone, but limestone and sandstone are much better at withstanding fire. So a small fire, your building is screwed if it's made out of granite. So that's one reason why you really shouldn't use granite so much. It's much more beautiful stone, but it's not always a superior stone uh f for use in construction all righty now next so speaking about egypt and well the, for instance you'll hear this last time especially brian foster that there was this cataclysm that destroyed the stone like how was this stone destroyed uh well let's look at so strabo others as well um 
the, the madness of Cambyses, King Cambyses very famously invaded Egypt, did a lot of damage. Now, uh, which affords many evidences of the madness and sacrilege of Cambyses, who partly by fire and partly by iron sought to outrage the temples, mutilating them and burning them on every side, just as he did with the obelisks. So whether it's the statues or obelisks that have this damage to them, which is described as by a cataclysm, uh, it, for instance, Colossi of Memnon, uh, even here again, Strabo is describing this. Um, Diodorus also mentions this as well down in the Thebes area. So, all right. Now, according to Brian Foster, the, this, this is evidence of, of a cataclysm, which would mean the cosmic cataclysm is a sniper. And from millions and millions of miles away, this cataclysm just like had the intelligence and the dedication to target monuments uh, whether whether they were in south america or egypt it was like yes this is like you know intelligent cataclysms now they didn't hit the stone a few miles away they just hit particular sites where where the lost high technology sort of type of thing is so this again this is the this is absurd um what was there a cataclysm well pro yeah, probably many uh could have a cataclysm as described by brian foster have done what's described absolutely not uh, unless it is a sniper that only picked stone worked areas it didn't it's like here's a wall I'll, it's cataclysm here on the wall but the bedrock that's 10 meters away from there that's not damaged so this cataclysm you know that firstly that that damage that's fire setting damage because it's <laughs> that's the shape that sort of comes from it so I mean, you, you compare, uh, here's a clip, you know, do enough fire setting. This is how you would, Ted, if you want to destroy a, a granite, set fire to it for a very short time, throw some water on it. Set fire to it for maybe half an hour, an hour, not even, not even using water to get that thermal shock. Uh, it is going to cr crumble and break apart without use of any tools. So, again, fire setting, you know, a traditional method, all right, so number of things you can uh, but this cataclysm no it didn't it didn't target only monuments it's not the cataclysm was not intelligent uh sniper that you know could pick a couple of square meters but it, you know it, the rest of the world got was not cataclysmed just the monuments just the uh walls and so forth so that's another furphy that needs to be put to bed forever Scientists Against Smiths, their video dolerite versus granite. So they took a, uh, got a piece of granite. They had, their scales was limited to 55 kilos. So if you watch a full video, see that they, they cut the granite using a modern tool. That was just to reduce the weight so they could put it on their scales. Uh, I think it was about, they spent about, you know, half an hour in turn, just, you know, first time experiment uh, on their own. But there have been other dolerite pounding stone experiments to see how much material you can move and so you pound for a while take the stone weigh it and compare it to its uh, original weight and then you can work out how much you know how long does that take so from their experiments which backs up earlier ones using dolerite pounds as the unfinished obelisk at Aswan would have been ab about a year to make using only dolerite pounders, not using fire setting or any other technique at all. So again, you might hear that it's thousands, like how did they do thousands of years? No, it would take about a year. Um, the dolerite that they were using was from Russia. And they so their calculations based on the material that they were removing, they estimated to be about 18 months to make the obelisk. So this is an important because you use fire now in combination with fire setting. So we saw that fire setting experiment. Uh, 18 months just using pounders. Now if we compare, I'll bring that clip up again and compare how far the fire setting team, how much they achieved compared to the pounding stone team. Uh, and they were also working for uh, about half an hour. 5% in seconds. The rock rapidly contracts. Ooh. 
No, it's very hot, very, very hot. But what damage has the heat done? Adel can now experiment whether the fire-weakened stone is easier to split than a second untreated fracture. After half an hour, he calls stop. Without fire, the workmen on the control test have made little impact on the fracture line. But at the burnt fracture, the crack is crumbling. You can see how the fire sitting affected with the granite layers. It's working very, very fast, more than what we have expected before. That explains how the ancient Egyptian made a lot of obelisks in very, very short times. It's therefore like... So based on the experiments using only dolerite pounders, one to one and a half years, uh, with a team of, I think, about 150, again, well, it took one, one and a half years and 150 men. This is for the king. So even just dollarite pounders without fire setting, it is not like impossible, remarkable or inefficient or out of a question that that would have been done on its own. But that's assuming that that's all that they had. But we can see that, again, people everywhere have been using fire setting as a tool. It's just bog standard, very simple to work out. You know, the first people to make a campfire and put some rocks around the outside, especially granite, would have realized how quickly uh, this rock breaks. And, and so prehistoric people would have known about this just by observing, you know, as soon as you got fire, what's going on there? Uh, hot rocks that they used to use to make hot water. You'd heat up a rock, you would drop it into a, a pool of water and it gives you you know in the morning you want freezing water or you want nice warm water to clean your face well use a hot rock but dollarite pounders only one to one and a half years based on the legitimate experiments that have been documented such as scientists against smith i'll put a little compilation at the end of the lost high technologists and how they experiment with pounding stones at Aswan. but uh, at so fire setting at the very very least i'm being extremely conservative here is 10 times more efficient. I'd say many times that. I'd say 50, maybe 100 times more efficient. Uh, but there are a few steps, you know, like you have to stop work to do a few steps, but that's, again, very short time. You only, in this experiment uh, that they conducted at Diaz one uh, quarry, they burnt for an hour. You don't need to burn that long to get that. That was their first experiment. If they maybe, you know, do a few more and reduce it down, uh, maybe as little as five minutes, but 10 to 15 minutes is more than enough time to apply the heat to break up the stone. So based on the very, 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 very conservative figure of it being 10 times more efficient to fire set and then use pounders as to use pounders alone, uh, it would be a, a couple of months, uh, even again being very, very conservative in the opposite direction, Within three months, to remove that amount of stone would be very, very easy to do. So uh, I'd, I'd go for a month um, to do that, to, to work at it. And, and going slow, three to four months, with, a, with very, very small teams. They're not 150 anymore. Uh, a very small team, 20 to 30 guys working at it. Uh, you'd be absolutely chewing up this granite removing blocks and not just removing the blocks remember the the rubble the leftover is an uh, a valuable resource on its own for many other applications but also for getting the chemistry out of a rocks and applying it for well across the whole industry whether it's um, makeup or whatever now we go back to this uh, so we have that shot the people using stout pounding stones for half an hour, you know, it's just started to make little scoop marks on there. That same size team that burnt for an hour and then went away with the dollarite um, pounders for about half an hour, they removed this very, very large trench in that very short time. So you just that's about a foot wide, at least six foot long. It's about a foot and a half. So again, you can work out the volume of stone that was removed and to make that unfinished obelisk, to remove a giant block, for instance, to make a sarcophagus, not only possible, very, very efficient, very, very quickly. 
And then, again, with other experiments and, and grinding ones that I've conducted myself, you get the block rough and then you grind away to get the smooth, flat surface. And again, you're talking hours, not days, not weeks, not years to flatten up the surface. It is just stone. It is just granite. Get a couple pieces of granite and just rub them against one another uh, over a piece of paper um, you know, for 20 minutes and see how much material comes off. Now, if you add an abrasive to that and have you know develop your technique a little bit more, you get very quickly getting off posted experiments you know in or show the whole clip on it you know uh speed it up because you know who wants to watch an hour and a half of rubbing stone but again the, you can repeat these these can be done they're very cheap they're very easy and there is an absolute vacuum when it comes to lost ancient high technology and not only discussing these possibilities but uh also the experiments that they conduct uh, apparent experiments are bad faith experiments and let's do a comparison uh, to those, I have to include that because you know they're the ones saying these things, and so they, you know they can't hide you know behind that I'm just a truth seeker looking for it. No, 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 that's not going to wash. Uh, doesn't make any sense. And engineers go there, they say no, that's that's ridiculous, and then they try to figure out what kind of tools and uh, or machines that were used to uh, to create them. And so over the years. <laughs> Oh, wait, you're serious. Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> uh, so th that's it. Look, you, fire setting, dolerite, pounders, all of these things not only work, not only is the evidence of their usage there, uh, they also work effectively, efficiently. This is one of the arguments. Oh, so, for instance, Brian Foster used to say the Egyptians had not, you know, they can't use copper to cut granite. And now I've noticed in a recent re-upload of an older video is now swapped to, well, we all know that the Egyptians couldn't cut granite efficiently. Still having to address the, the question, you know, the internet has a long memory, Brian. But anyway, I'll put this paper in, and uh, this is one example now, if Academia EDU, if you open an account, you can select, you know, you choose what areas you're interested in. So granite, ancient Egypt, put in those keywords, they, they will start sending you papers on those particular topics and the more you look the more that the uh the cookies there will give you even more papers so canal extension confirmed by ge geophysical surveys as one obelisk quarry as one egypt they also see that the they'll recommend a whole bunch of papers by other authors um egyptian quarries uh granite quarry survey uh eight fire setting that's the same author but anyway you can see you now uh, limestone sandstone quarrying uh, a lot of work a lot of papers have been published on this it's just an absolute falsehood when a lost ancient eye technologist says they they ignore us and they won't take our you know that they're suppressing us or they're not ignoring us the mainstream is well no rubbish absolute rubbish but also ancient aliens lost high technology is the mainstream now they can't keep playing this game that Oh, we're being suppressed. We're the underdogs and the big baddies are treating us so mean. Oh, we're they so mean to us. You are the mainstream at this time. Ancient Aliens, uh, the YouTube out, that top rating show promoted by you know, what used to be the History Channel. Uh, the algorithms on all of the social media. You put in ancient history and you, this pops up first. They're pushing this. You are the establishment. You are getting all the attention. All the resources are coming towards you. But I'll put this link to the paper, this particular one in the description, because it's talk, you know it's just one of many. I'm talking about the Aswan Quarry, there are a few interesting points. Now, for instance, the Dolorite Pounders. Uh, there's a seam there where the Dolorite can be found. So there's another, you know, again, the lost Brian Foster, uh, K 2019. I'll say that the, there's a big granite block there where the Taurus can use that pounding stone. There's a dolerite ball inserted into the stone. This is apparently lost high technology. No, what it is is a xenolith. It's a foreign stone that's been imported in there. The dolerite runs through the quarries there. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where they come. That's why they're there. They weren't imported from a long distance away. Um, the material's right there to be used and it comes out, well, Anyway, so also there's this map. Now, the important feature about this is that the confirmation of the quarry, of the canals. So 
just like the main the sites that contain this granite, the quarry, Aswan Quarry and others, uh, there are a couple of others that are a bit of a distance, but the majority of all the Egyptian quarries are right on the river, right next to the river. So when they say it's, it had to be transported 500 miles, technically true, but in reality it's uh, a mile, half a mile, even less, depending on what part of the quarry from getting the stone from its location to the river onto a barge. The, the Egyptians had boats that carried those weights. Again, if you've heard that, absolute nonsense. Uh, the solar boat of Khufu is not the largest boat. Uh, it's the largest intact one, but they, they had much bigger boats than that. So you need to move the stone a very short distance, less than a mile or a small fraction of that from the quarry to the river. The river direction, the current delivers the stone to the location and then it's again less than a mile uh, or a fraction of that from the river to the final location of that. So in reality the stones being used only had to be transported half a mile to two miles. Um, the river took the rest. You know, I can't go into that but so that's another sort of where they sort of building something up that isn't there but so uh, there's evidence here of canals so these unfinished obelisks uh, or the ones that were finished you make the obelisk you build a canal to there and then you can float the thing out even with the room for instance the unfinished obelisk if you were to encase that once it's uh, done Archimedes principle you know um, displacement of water so the the barge carrying the obelisk only has to displace it only has to be slightly larger a small gap on either side uh, will displace enough water to be able to lift those barges it's just established you know you can just work these things out very easily it's not a mystery and these canals where sometimes when the rain comes and the uh, maybe flood waters you can still see how these old pits where the stone was extracted uh, come from as well lots of work done uh, again, not just on paper. We've, you know, some, it's not just about graphs and stuff. There are lots of experiments that have been done to show, to prove, absolutely, definitively prove the artifacts, including the burned rock, is still at the quarries. Uh, this technique goes around for a really, really, really long time, and now it's up to the, you know. Uh, We've placed our pieces, we've, we've shown our cards. We've done the experiments, we've collected the data, uh, we've put this down, now it's time. You can, <laughs> Lust Ancient Height, it's not good enough for you, Annie XT and Jimmy and Bright Insight uh, and uh, Uncharted X and Brian Foster to go with a pounding stone and have some, you know, suddenly they lose all coordination and after 30 seconds of tapping away, it's like, this is, this is proof that this cannot be done. No, it's proof that you don't know how to, you have very little interest uh, and you're not very diligent and you're not really interested in, in understanding these things because that's where your moolah comes from. That's where your money comes from. Alrighty, so rant over, all those sources are there. You can, again, easy, cheap to test for yourself. Uh, if you want to argue, yeah, you can argue all you want, but you've got, you got to provide data. It's not up to us now. It's up, you know, you must provide something. So fire setting, stone pounders, uh, using, again, I posted a video a while back showing people actually using flint tools to carve granite, using stone pounders to, uh, so again, this has all been done. This is done. It is finished. It, it, you know, there is, uh, if you want to argue, then you must do something about it and say, so, you know, I have people say, oh, this is CGI or they've edited it out or whatever. And my standard response is, well, okay, then, then you, you know, I've even had stonemasons of all, like, you know, internet comment stone, I've met 20 year stonemason and this, this is silly, it can't be done. Well, if these, if my experiments are cheats, if the scientists against Smith are cheating, if these other people who have actually done the work are cheating, then all you need to do is get a few bucks, get those tools, you post the video and show and prove because you're, that, yeah, you know, you can do it. You can expose us cheats. You know, we're cheating and we're using CGI and we're fraudsters and, you know, we, you know, all our videos are, you know, it's, un, it, our, we've faked it. Well, you want to be an internet rock star, post it. 
do something, you know, get it and show, well, no, this is false, that I can't do that. And then we're done. I'm inviting you, please, try it, go for it. Let's see, even better yet, still open, I haven't had any, I've had a lot of comments say, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I, in the comment section ends very quickly. I just say, let's do a live stream. Let's te- you do it on one side, I'll do it on the other side. We'll do it in real time and end of discussion. Either I'll be proved false or you'll be proved false. And anyone watching the live stream can follow along. Cheap, simple, easy to use tools. And so with that, again, another, another one bites the dust in terms of these uh, lost high technology. They're still posting this. This was years old during that 10 to 5 year period that they've been doing it. No development, no evolution, no change. Just the same old stuff over and over. And with all those years, they couldn't find anything. They couldn't do an experiment. Nah, no, 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 no. Jimmy, do your best, buddy.